OK, good morning. Uh, my name is Chris Scott. Uh, I work for Outdoor Recreation Northern Ireland and we deliver the VSG Secretariat services. So you're all very welcome to this, the, the latest uh, webinar in the, in the VSG series. Uh, this one is entitled the risk control spectrum and its application during COVID-19 and, and beyond. Um, so we're delighted to have 114 uh, delegates registered for, for this webinar. Um, we typically get about a, between 65 and, and 70 percent if you join us join us live so I can see you all starting to, to, to come on there now. Um, this webinar is obviously recorded um, so those who don't get to see it live can 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 watch it uh, tomorrow it will be sent out via easing tomorrow uh, along with all the, the slide deck and the Q&A transcript as well so you can share that um, with uh, with colleagues who haven't been able to, to, to make it t today um, it's recorded we, we can't see you you can obviously see See us so you don't need to, to, to worry about that. We've had that question before. Um, so if you want to just move on to my next slide there, Alan, please. Um, so obviously this um, this webinar is about the, the risk control uh, spectrum, which is a key cornerstone of, of VSG. Um, and it's covered in depth, obviously, within the Managing Visitor Safety and the Countryside pub publication. You can see the front cover on the screen there. Um, so, you know, after the webinar, you can you can take an opportunity that's available to, to purchase online. There's also an opportunity to purchase in, in bulk numbers for your organisation um, as well. So, um, and we'll be sharing the link to that in, in the message pane and also in the easing circulated tomorrow. So, so worth uh, reflecting on your learnings from today and, and having a look at, at, at the publication. Um, if you just move on to my next slide there, Alan, please. So just to give you an overview of the running order for today. So the first session really is, is about uh, back to basics. Um, so we'll be joined by Ken Dodd, VSG chair, who's going to look at the origin and, and the development of the risk control spectrum. And then we'll be joined by both Dave Liddy from Natural Resource Wales and Jenny Wilson from Forestry England to look at understanding and applying uh, the risk control spectrum. We have an opportunity for a very brief uh, Q&A there. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in, in a moment how you're going to ask questions over the, over the question panel. Um, we'll then move on to, to session two uh, after that and that really looks at uh, applications uh, of the risk control spectrum but particularly considering a uh, the impact uh, and issues that have been brought forward by by COVID-19. Um, obviously, in our in our last webinar, we we talked about the the new visitor, um, a well discussed topic over 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 the spring and, and summer and, and indeed on into the autumn. Um, new visitors and and how those visitors have have changed the way they access and engage with a, with our sites. So there'll be a range of videos uh, to to discuss that, and then we discuss those further, obviously within within the breakout rooms, which is session three. So in the breakout rooms will leave this this live event and you have all been provided links then to the breakout rooms which are like a traditional teams meeting so we will see you during those and there'll be opportunity uh, for discussion so again over the course of the, if you just want to move on to my next slide there Alan please uh, over the course of the webinar, I, I'd really encourage you to make sure that you ask plenty of questions within the live Q&A pane. Um, that allows the breakout room chairs to keep an eye on those, uh, answer them maybe during the, the webinar itself, um, but also um, keep an eye on those and that'll help focus conversation during the various breakout rooms. So I'd encourage you to do that. Obviously, there's probably about 70 of us on this call in 70 different locations, so interaction is, is challenging. Um, so the more, the more questions you ask and the more you engage, um, the more value we all get out of the more value we all get out of the, the session. If you want to just move on to the next slide there, Alan, please. Um, yeah, so we're going to move straight in to um, into session one. And as I said at the start there, our first presentation is from, from Ken Dodd, who'll be who'll be known to, to you all as, as VSG chair. And Ken is going to um, give us a presentation on the origins and origins and development of the, the risk control spectrum. So Ken, can you can you hear me okay? And can we hear you? You're just on mute there, Ken. Can you hear that's me? The, yep, that's the catchphrase of the year. You're just on mute there, but we can hear you now. Yeah, that's great. So we'll get you up on screen and we'll get your slides up on screen and then we'll, we'll pass over to you. OK, thanks, Chris. Um, our journey today starts a century ago. 1966, the go, go back three, Alan. Iconic events of 1996, the uh, 
Nintendo 64 console next. The Spice Girls uh, hit the UK charts and Jurassic Park was the great uh, blockbuster movie of the year and the biggest happening of the year, some think, is the uh, origins of visitor safety management, an uh, expression that had never been heard before 1996. Next. At that time, I uh, worked for British Waterways and the European Union sent out a, a fascinating directive on manual handling, which was hit upon with great glee by the Transport, Transport and General Workers Union, who our lockkeepers uh, mostly uh, were involved with. And they hit upon the EU directive on handling and loads to say that the lock keepers shouldn't actually push a balance beam on uh, one of the old canal locks or wind that paddle gearing. Um, and we obviously had some issues to overcome next. But um, at the time, I had director level responsibility for freight and leisure and tourism. And although we did have lock keepers in British waterways, 99% of our locks were actually operated by uh, our visitors, boaters uh, and Joe public. Um, so it got me thinking that whilst we rightly were looking at um, risk to employees, uh, were we adequately looking at risk to our visitors? Next. It was a, a perfect storm around that time as well, 1996. Um, a couple of years before, there was what came known as the uh, the Lime Bay tragedy. tragedy. Now, Lime Bay is in Dorset, and four teenage girls uh, very sadly drowned and unnecessarily drowned um, in a canoeing accident. And it led to something that completely was brand new and shocked the whole system, which was the application of HASWA, the Health and Safety at Work Act, by um, the Health and Safety Executive, who actually took to court, a criminal court, um, the owner and uh, managing director of the company that was supposedly looking after these girls who were canoeing on an adventure day out in the bay. Um, the company had absolutely no systems in place for the safety of the children that they were looking after. Uh, they didn't take uh, weather forecasts. They hadn't worked out what to do if one of the children turned over a canoe. So rightly, I think they were prosecuted. Uh, and in fact, the, the owner of the company uh, was um, imprisoned for two years for manslaughter. Next. At the time, then Brian Dice, who was the chief executive of uh, British Waterways, came to me and said, Ken, if um, somebody was one of our visitors, one of our boaters was to drown or someone's to fall in a, in a lock and uh, injure themselves, am I going to end up in court? Am I going to end up in prison? Have we got systems in place uh, with respect to my responsibilities? And I said, well, Brian, I'm frankly, no, I don't, <laughs> I don't think we have. So we, we better have a look at uh, whether we had in place the sort of things that uh, the court was telling the adventure activities company they should have had in place. Um, so I wrote about two dozen, three dozen letters to everybody I knew at the time to see if anybody else had put some systems in place to look at risk to the visitors on their property. And I can tell you in 1996, absolutely nobody was doing anything. In fact, most of the replies said, what do you mean visitor management? Amongst the replies, uh, the Environment Agency and the Forestry Commission were a little bit more positive. They said, no, we're not doing anything, but we think we ought to be doing something. And perhaps we, we could get together and talk about it. This was a bit disappointing to me because uh, being a bit of a lazy sod, I was hoping that somebody else had solved this problem and I could have gone back to the British Waterways Chief Exec and say, I've solved all our problems, Brian. Um, at the time, I used to go to a thing called the World Canals Conference uh, next, 
And um, amongst the navigation authorities that I met was the manager of the Rideau Canal in Canada and the Trent Seven Waterway also in Canada. So I, I wrote to them. They replied and rather sadly again said, no, we're not doing anything for this visitor risk management. However, they, uh, those waterways in Canada are managed and run by the National Parks Authority in Canada. And they said, but we have got a lady called Jenny Sparks, who um, is, has just been appointed this year in Parks Canada and she's working in the Rockies. Um, I can put you in touch with her next. And they, they duly did. And Jenny Sparks uh, had actually started looking at visitor risk management and the combination of British Waterways, Forestry Commission and Environment Agency actually paid her airfare and expenses to come over to the UK in 96. Uh, she spoke at a conference that we organised in a hotel in York. And at that conference, uh, at the end of it, I said, does anybody want to work with us and see if we can develop visitor risk management? And, and out of that, I think uh, four or five organisations said, oh, yeah, yeah, we'd, we'd like to get involved in that. Um, and what be, uh, became the visitor safety group uh, was actually formed. Next. However, the first task, the problem and issue that we had was to come up with some guiding principles. Next, the sort of principles that um, were applicable in that court case from the Health and Safety at Work Act, we didn't think were particularly helpful in terms of managing risk to visitors. You've got so many dif differences with your employees, you can tell them what to do. You can send them home. Um, for most of us, most of our visitors, or many of our visitors, we're not in touch with them at all. If you take the um, employee risk management, there were well laid down uh, health and safety executive rules which said if you identify a high risk that's likely to kill somebody, uh, what you should do is eliminate that hazard. Well, you're likely to be killed if you fall off a mountain or a cliff top uh, or you drown in a river, a lake or a reservoir. But we can't eliminate mountains. We can't eliminate cliff edges. We can't fill in every lake, reservoir, canal or river. So the first absolute uh, building block of traditional risk management for employee safety just in the main doesn't work for our sort of environment. So what, do the, what does HSE next tell us to do? Uh, well, they, the HSE says if, if you can't, um, if, if you can't eliminate the risk, you've got to stop people getting access to it. Um, but we don't want to, it wouldn't be practical to fence every single cliff edge, every single mountain top, put a fence along either, either side of every mile of river and canal in the country. And people actually are, are we're not dealing with employees, our visitors, many of them actually actively going into the countryside and they're seeking risk. They want to walk along a, uh, a, uh, an arete. Uh, if you're an extreme mountain biker, you want to go down the, a steeper and steeper hillside on a, a more and more challenging run. So the, the very basic principles uh, that underpinned employee safety weren't helpful to us. So we began to formulate uh, right at the outset these sort of guiding principles, uh, which, as you can see, because because our users are different to employees, uh, needed a different type of framework for us to be uh, certain about how we were managing and were we managing properly. Next. So we, the, there's a whole, I can't go, th there isn't time to go through all these principles in detail. And as Chris said, they're, they're all in the book and they're all illustrated in the book. But, but you can see as we, we were beginning to come to some sort of way of managing that risk, ensuring uh, that in the case of the, the, the downhill uh, cyclist, this is Dolby Forest, 
uh, so that the casual ordinary day-to-day -day cyclist doesn't stray into something that's too dangerous. Make sure that uh, you bring to the attention of the, the visitors what what's in front of them. Uh, don't give them any any nasty surprises. Next. Another one of our uh, principles. Next, please, Anne. Another one of our principles is um, to do with partnership and to do with uh, our sort of visitors in, in all sorts of ways uh, are not uh, homogenous. So could we recognise that people uh, have different attitudes towards risk? Next. These girls getting the photographs right on the edge. Next. Compared to this guy, a colleague of mine, uh, Mark Daniels, some of you <laughs> will know, and that's about as close as Mark wanted to, to get to that particular danger. So, so people, people are different and we need to recognise that in, our, in how we manage risk. Next. We also think it's reasonable to expect uh, our visitors to take responsibility for um, younger people or people who are, are not as um, able to look after themselves and here uh, we have families scrambling around um, probably to the annoyance of English heritage who manage this site Beeston Castle next and this particular father has decided that he's managing the risk of his children and they can learn about scrambling and drops and so on. It's quite a big drop there, um, but he's obviously taken the decision that that's OK. Next. I'm not so sure because that's where those children were scrambling. So on the far side of the um, that wall, they would have certainly fallen to their death. Now, th this raise a number of interesting questions. Um, going to our no nasty surprises principle, that father of those children must have seen that risk because he walked right the way past it immediately before going on to that site. Um, I and my colleagues had loads of discussions about that at the time, but it decided that it is reasonable to expect them to take care. There were no nasty surprises, so actually, that site was being managed perfectly safely as it was. Next. This principle on responsibility now takes us to what the rest of uh, today's webinar uh, is, is about. And in particular, the second bullet there as to how we balance what we expect of the visitors, what, what can we reasonably expect them to do and behave, and what should we do? Next. Next, please, Alan. This is um, the very first model that we came up with. Um, with actually the, the old image of the group around the turn of the century. And you can see there are, what, no more than a dozen members of the group. We've well over 60 now. But at the time, we were a small working group. And we came up with this idea, we call it a matrix at the, at the time. We now call it a spectrum because somebody told, somebody known better than me said it was a spectrum from end to end rather than a matrix. But the notion was that as you went from a more urban, more developed um, environment to a more remote, a wilder environment, you could reasonably expect uh, our visitors to take more care for themselves. These, this principle, or one of the principles, a model to illustrate one of our fundamental principles, has been unchanged since um, the, the start of this century next and has appeared in uh, all our subsequent publications, albeit in slightly different form. This example is from 2003, our first publication. Next. Here it comes in the uh, 2011 uh, version, and each time when we reprinted or we rewrote the publications, we revisited the principles, and at no time have we changed any of them. They've stood the test of time. And basically it said next, at the extremes, it's relatively easy. In the most remote, undeveloped areas, we should expect our users to virtually take care of themselves. Next. 
But at the other end of the spectrum where you've got maybe a visitor centre or a children's playground, it's reasonable for uh, our users with minimal levels of skill to look after themselves. It's reasonable for the management intervention to be at quite a high level. Next. The principle applied pretty well. Next, this is it in the historic built environment publication. Next, please, Arne. And again, at the uh, lightly visited the undeveloped end of the spectrum, you'd expect very little management intervention. Um, and next. And at the opposite end of the spectrum, that was Castle Rig we were looking at before. Next, please, Arne. Uh, in Cumbria in miles from anywhere compared to uh, Edinburgh Castle with the two where you've got thousands of visitors in the dark, where you'd have very high levels of management intervention and not expect the visitors to that castle to really be looking very much uh, after themselves. Next, the current publication has it um, reflected visually in a slightly different way. Uh, but as I say, the principles have remained um, valid throughout the period next and have proved their value in case law. Uh, can't go into the detail because of time now, but in the top case, one of our members, RSPB, the, the judge in finding uh, against the plaintiff who was injured on that property, uh, actually talked about the risk control matrix in his summing up and said he accepted that it was a valid way for RSPB to manage the site. And the bottom one uh, included is very important where the uh, development company were actually the cable car company that were taking people up skiing uh, on uh, Annick Moor. And one of the skiers fell over that cornice there and fractured um, both arms and a leg and sued the cable car company and the judge said well the cable car company could have put signs up but that would have been a terrible intrusion in the mountainside it was perfectly reasonable for the um, the managers of the skiing to expect the skier to have taken responsibility and not fall over the edge so we didn't need to put into the interventions in that into the countryside so that's a, that's a very quick whistle stop tour as to how these principles came about and I'm going to next I'm going to hand over now to Chris who will introduce some of my colleagues who are who will tell us whether or not the principles of uh, uh, seen the test survive the test of time and are useful for them in today's management. Great Ken thank you thank you very much indeed um, for that overview um, yeah it's, it's been really interesting to watch that actually and, and see um, how those initial thoughts back in 1996 by by some wise minds have um, yeah have been translated and refined uh, across across the years um, but it's been it's been really interesting to see that the starting point is not where we came from there um, so yeah so I'm going to quickly pass over um, to Jenny Wilson first of all who's technical recreation advisor from Forestry England um, uh, Jenny will then just pass on to Dave I won't jump back in in between. Um, so yeah, we've had Jenny and Dave double act and they're going to talk to us about understanding and applying the spectrum that the Ken's just introduced. So Jenny, I'm going to pass over to you. Can you hear me OK? Yes, I can. Hopefully you can hear me too, Chris. We can Thanks indeed. So, so I'll just pass straight over to you. Mm. Excellent. That's brilliant. Thank you and welcome everyone. Good morning. Um, so I'm going to launch straight in. Alan, if you could please the next slide, that'd be great. So um, as Ken has just uh, beautifully given a fantastic overview of the principles and the risk control spectrum, um, many of you will be incredibly familiar with what you're seeing in the screen in front of you here. Um, and you will be adept at, at, at translating this and using it practically out on sites that you manage and look after. Um, but for those of you that are new to the organisation that you work for, or in fact you're a new member to Visitor Safety Group, we thought it would be helpful for Dave and I to just bring some of this to life and kind of exemplify what we mean when we talk about the risk control spectrum. So um, as Ketan has said, uh, the uh, important thing here is about striking the balance, the right balance between the level of visitor self-reliance that is expected on your sites and the management interventions that you put in place to manage the risks and um, and uh, issues that you have on site. So as you see from the diagram above, uh, very, very briefly as an overview, uh, as you go left on the uh, side of the diagram and the remote uh, and the terrain becomes more remote uh, and rugged, the level of uh, visitor skill and so self-reliance um, is expected to be that bit higher and more advanced and therefore the number of management interventions and the type of management interventions are considerably lower. 
Conversely, as you move further right on the diagram towards the heavily developed end of the spectrum um, and the visitor numbers increase, the terrain and location become more developed, more urban, um, and, and therefore the management interventions, both the level and type and complexity of them would also uh, be more advanced and increase. Um, and this vertical alignment that you see across the diagram in front of you between the different zones um, is, is usually how, how the, the uh, spectrum is implemented out on site. Um, but not always. And we've got some reflections on that uh, further down in the rest of the webinar from from colleagues across across the group. Um, and we're starting to see some of the wonkiness, if you like, as a result of COVID bringing new demographics and new visitors to different parts of the countryside. Um, but generally, if you work up and down the spectrum, you'll be able to understand both uh, the, the, the terrain and the visitors and then the management interventions that are appropriate to that location. It's important, as uh, Ken alluded to, to remember that not that one site is not necessarily going to be sitting firmly in one of these categories. It's not a discrete thing. You can't pop your visitor centre in here and go, yes, all of this site is entirely heavily developed. Therefore, my management interventions will be X, Y, Z. In fact, um, the concept of zoning is really important here when you're interpreting the uh, risk control spectrum here and in fact your zoning may not be a kind of target or a polo it might not go out in concentric rings away from the car park it might be more like a starfish or a blobby type approach given that you'll have trails and visitor infrastructure which draws people out on um on transects away from your car park so it's important to think about the zones in a kind of three-dimensional fashion um, and therefore the types of imp um, management interventions you'll put in place will be accordingly um, it doesn't cover everything. It doesn't cover adverse weather um, or uh, temporary changes in the, the type or use of your site. Um, and it doesn't incorporate how past decision making on your site may influence what you now do. Um, and I think we've alluded to it later on, but it's important to try and not take knee jerk reactions or long term responses to short temporary issues that may be occurring on your sites. There is, however, a general presumption against risk control measures being put in the remote areas of your sites. Um, but examples of this do exist where the risk is sufficiently high or the hazard is not obvious. As Ken said, the key here is no nasty surprises. So I'm going to hand over to Dave now, who's going to take you through uh, what I've just alluded to and Rick's described, but in with some with some pictures to bring it to life. Dave, over to you. OK, thanks, Jenny. We've got the next slide, please. OK, so uh, uh, Newborough Forest and, and Warren uh, National Nature Reserve, this is on Anglesey. So this is uh, one of Wales's uh, finest beaches. It's a, uh, a Corsican pine plantation was planted on sand dunes to protect the village back in the 1950s. Uh, and, and, and it's a tremendously popular site. You can see that was this Sunday uh, car park was uh, way beyond half full uh, with a very narrow beach when the tide was in. Uh, it was a bit of a procession, but you can see uh, already I'm describing, and if we go on to the next slide, uh, we're at the urban end here, we're at the heavily developed end. Uh, throughout the car park, there are speed bumps, there is delineation for the car parking, there are zebra crossings, it's got that very urban feel in the car park. Uh, there's concession areas, barbecue areas, uh, all very uh, rigorously laid out. You can see how we've got the uh, COVID queuing uh, railings uh, top left there outside the toilets with the sanitising station, uh, heavily developed. As you move uh, towards the beach, and it's pretty obvious which side the beach is because you can always hear the tide, uh, washing in and out, uh, a plethora of information signs. That's where the lifeguard information is and the water safety stuff. That's where all the trailhead panels are. Uh, but we're aware now of a, of a, that we're moving towards the beach. Bottom left, uh, bottom right rather, you can see uh, the entrance uh, to what used to be quite a long boardwalk. Uh, but climate change and, and some high tides have, uh, are continually shortening the length of that. Uh, that's our uh, time tunnel. Uh, what happens as you walk along there is an enormous transition. Uh, and you can see we've got the life ring uh, 
to the right of the boardwalk. And if we go on to the next one, next slide, please. <coughs> on the left, you can see the end of the boardwalk and you can see that sand slope and that's the transition. This is how we've got, this is how we've applied the zoning in Newborough from that very urban car park and, and trailhead panel information context. And you come down that transition, down that sand slope, and all of a sudden, you're on the most enormous and delightful and uh, what we consider to be a largely wild beach uh, and a complete absence of control measures. You know, uh, no hazard information signs, uh, despite the fact we've had people, uh, kids buried in the dunes making tunnels. Uh, we've tried to avoid all of the information signage about water safety uh, that the RNLI might like to recommend. Uh, and an almost complete absence of any uh, personal rescue equipment. So that's the zonation from the very heavily developed, a bit more moderately developed with that information. And now all of a sudden we've gone into a wild environment. If we go on to the next slide. And so it's a delight as you walk along the beach, it's just over a mile to get to Sandwin Island. Uh, we've got no signage about the fact that it's cut off uh, when the high tide comes in. I had to roll my trousers up to get across there when I arrived on Sunday. Uh, sand and shingle paths. We've got some very subtle control measures about inspecting the buildings uh, and the, the lighthouse, keep them safe, some path work. Uh, but really, it's about preserving the really high quality you know, cultural landscape that's out there. Some of you might have seen uh, the cottages that featured in a TV program uh, set 100 years ago in what it was like to be one of those pilot cutters uh, navigating uh, boats into uh, Carnarvon uh, Harbour. OK, so that's uh, a whistle stop tour through the spectrum. Heavily developed car park, a bit more moderately developed, and then you can see what a great job we've done there uh, in preserving you know that fantastic cultural landscape uh, there are cliffs that you could quite easily fall off the water is very deep outside the the pilots cottages uh, and i enjoyed swimming in at the weekend that's why i went there uh, but we've preserved the special qualities of the place it's really disappointing that somebody had still dropped their face mask that they'd taken the trouble uh, to carry uh, what was nearly two miles from the car park at that point, uh, but we won't dwell on that. Back to Jenny. Thanks, Dave. Um, it's brilliant to hear those reflections and for you to bring them to life with some photos. That's fantastic. As um, Dave has just alluded to, the key here is um, in understanding your sites, in working out what's going on, how people are using them, where the risks are, where the hazards are, what you need to manage and uh, intervene in, and crucially, what you don't need to intervene in. Um, it does require a nuanced approach. And as Ken said, the devil is in the details. So I would encourage you to work with others, look at your site, uh, take the risk control spectrum out with you. Page 20 and 21 in my book is always well thumbed and used on, on site out with other people. Um, so think about what you're going to do, explore the options, try them out, write them down, have a justification in your back pocket and on file somewhere and, and do reach out to other members in the visitor safety group because the membership can be really helpful to get an outside view on, on an issue or a topic that you're, you're tackling on site. Um, and it does help to avoid those knee jerk reactions, which we we have seen some of those legacy issues out on site in some of our uh, site visits that we've done and we're keen to avoid those in the future. So thanks very much. That's uh, it from Dave and I in bringing the visitor safety spectrum to life. Uh, back to you, Chris. Great, Jenny, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Dave and indeed Ken, a really good introduction to set the context to the webinar. So where, where it all came from 
a little bit about the understanding and, and, and the application. As I said, there's there's a, a, a spectrum there to base it on, but as, as Jenny said, that, that nuance and, and consideration is important uh, throughout. And I think Dave and, and Jenny have just volunteered themselves to deliver a, a zoning webinar sometime in the near future as well. <laughs> They're both shaking their heads rapidly at me in the background there. Um, but no, that was that was really useful. So yes, yeah, so no, listen, we're going to move on to the next section now. I hope you won't mind. We're going to skip past Q&A, just uh, conscious of time, plenty of opportunity for discussion in the breakout rooms at the end of the webinar. Um, we're going to talk about now about the application of the risk control uh, spectrum and obviously in the context of, of, of COVID-19. COVID-19 has changed the acceleration of thought and change uh, the risk control spectrum is perhaps no different. Uh, perhaps it stays exactly the same. That, that's probably the point of debate that we're, we're, we're talking about here. Um, so, so listen, we have a number of landowners have, have kindly went out on site and, and, and volunteered to take some, some videos. and I'm being filmed by my lovely colleague Joe Mason and we are the Technical Recreation Advisors for Forestry England. This morning we wanted to talk to you about the real value that we see in the risk control spectrum and for us it's one of the key documents and matrix which underpin our decision making process out on site whether that be here at our busy visitor centre at Wendover Woods or a smaller outlying beet woodland site in one of our smaller car parks which may have very minimal facilities in it. It's really important that we use the right level of intervention, management intervention, to control the risks that our visitors experience. And the risk control spectrum allows us to do that in a proportional and appropriate way for the site that we're managing. We've noticed over the last six to nine months, well, really since March, that the visitors have changed dramatically on our sites. As a result of congestion, uh, travel times and travel restrictions, we've noticed that we've started to get more visitors with a lower level of skill or self-reliance visiting some of our um, more moderately developed and lightly developed sites. This poses an issue for us in terms of how we manage and support those visitors to have a safe but quality experience on our sites. And we'd like to talk you through some of the interventions that we've made, both in the short, medium and longer term over the next five minutes. Across our sites, we've had to put a range of measures in place to ensure a COVID safe environment. And these include signage, closing facilities as government guidance changes, and improving our digital and social media communications. And in some places, signage hasn't been enough and we've had to install permanent barriers to help us control visitors on site. As time progressed, we realised that some of the interventions that we put in place quickly as a response to the pandemic have to be converted to something more medium to long term. So, for example, some of our laminated signs that went up early on had to be converted into something that would last um, and the weather over the winter. So these have been converted using the same artwork to something semi-permanent or permanent using dye bond or corrects. And around some of our fixed facilities and our higher developed sites, we've put in place more long-term measures that are in keeping with the building. And we've also taken steps to introduce technology to help us manage visitor safety. So for example here, paying by the glide up means that people don't have to touch our paint spray machines and it reduces congestion and queuing around our pavements. One. Welcome to Wendover Woods. We've seen a massive increase um, in visitor numbers with COVID. So this time last year we had um, 900 cars in the car park, whether it's the same weekend this year, we have 3,000. We're hoping that COVID-19 is a medium term issue. And so our response needs to be planned accordingly and we must resist knee-jerk responses with long-term consequences and act in a proportional way. Here is an example of a long-term response to a short-term issue. You can see the two gates and this used to be an area where members of the public would park informally to access our forests. This uh, closer metal gate has been installed recently by the landowner and it could be down to the risk appetite of that landowner and it deals with the problem immediately with hard infrastructure but it could be considered an extreme reaction to a time-bound issue that could have been managed in a more phased way. An alternative method to manage this in a phased way might be to place for example boulders or concrete slabs to prevent access or alternatively lay a tree trunk and these things can be moved at a later stage when things might return to normality. Alternatively, you could use natural earth buns or use tree plantings and shrubs to stop access in the short term 
which is a much more aesthetically pleasing way of controlling access. We've talked extensively today about our response to COVID-19 and the visitor safety management methods that we've put in place as a result of that. But whilst we've talked about that, we could be equally talking about any other short to medium term intervention or issue, such as timber harvesting, um, maintenance or infrastructure management, installation of new paths, um, or in fact an event or activity that you put in place for a short period of time on a site and the visitor demographics may have temporarily changed. What we can be sure of is that the, visitor, the risk control spectrum does not need to change. It stood the test of time and there's flexibility and adaptability within it to flex beyond the vertical correlation that we are traditionally used to. So Forestry England is a big supporter of the risk control spectrum and we highly recommend that you use it and implement it on your sites. Hey, good morning. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to Coyle Brennan. Uh, my name's Dave Liddy and I'm a Recreation Safety Advisor for Natural Resources Wales. Uh, quite a grey day here this morning, uh, but this is our flagship site. We're talking today about the BSG spectrum and how applicable it is uh, in the modern world. Well, uh, I'm a real advocate for that spectrum and uh, I think it's got plenty of mileage yet uh, in Snowdonia, we've been having some uh, big issues post-COVID. You'll have all seen all of the social media and it made it onto national news about awful parking problems around the Snowdon area. And so it's not surprising that at that very big scale, uh, they've taken some very serious action and they're now discussing uh, park and ride, how to get cars out of that central bit of Snowdonia, uh, how you have to book to go up to the park at Penna Pass, uh, and how they're hoping to remove cars, particularly tourism cars, from that whole central part of the National Park. So that's a, that heavily developed end of the spectrum. Those, they're doing significant structural changes, yeah, the big things, uh, to tackle the big problem area. Now associated with that, uh, the Highways Authority, on their big matrix signs, they were saying Snowden is closed. To treat the big things, they're taking, they're doing the big ticket items to manage health and safety. You know, all of which is about uh, a lot of people in the same place spreading COVID. But if you've got cars parked on the side of the road, that means you're going to have people walking in and amongst the cars. And then you've got traffic to and from Flamberis, uh, which is an obvious risk. So parking and signage. Our other big ticket item, while we're at our big ticket site, we're going to have to start working uh, with Visit Wales a bit more. This group has talked about sustainable tourism and places like uh, Newbra in particular. Newbra is our biggest, most popular site uh, in Natural Resources Wales and it's just being overrun with people, you know. Every Visit Wales post has got the lovely pictures with Llanduin Island and the sea and the mountains in the background. Quite frankly, Visit Wales, it's full and we're going to have to work with them and start uh, stopping them advertising it because it's being overrun. Yeah, so there are some big ticket items uh, that we can do to have maximum effect on our biggest sites. Okay, so we've moved on to Tinnegroyd's picnic site now. You can see we've got a toilet block, small car park, couple of trails start from here. A moderately developed site with fewer visitor facilities. Sites like this don't lend themselves to it, but one of the other post-COVID steps we're going to take is get more staff involved so that we can give our visitors more first-hand, first-party information uh, to improve the quality of their visit uh, and just to step up that safety levels. It won't happen here, but it will certainly happen at Newbra, our busiest site. It's important in a, on a more moderate and scale that we've got our website information up to date, all clear, what's open, what's closed, so that people know before they set off exactly what they're coming for. And something that we're going to avoid uh, going forward, and I know a lot of organisations did it uh, during the uh, lockdown karaoke uh, is just doing the social media tick box. Take a photo, make the point, tick the box, move on. 
We don't think that that's been terribly effective and so we're going to try a much more thorough communications package of messages next time. Finally, we've moved to a lightly developed site here at Pont Kaina Koi. You can see we've got a small car park, uh, trailhead information, and then we're off over the bridge, over the river, and into the outlying part of Koi de Brennan. We haven't got very many control measures here, some bollards, uh, a bit of signage and information for visitors. Post-COVID, the most important thing to do here is make sure that we've sorted out all of our welcome back signage to try and encourage good social distancing. As we move into next year, it's going to be really important to keep the place tidy and make sure that we've uh, prioritised all of our inspection and maintenance of all that you know, COVID signage. It's really easy for it to get a bit tatty. We've seen it all season. It's fallen over. The wind's shifted it round the post. Uh, and so we're going to make a big effort uh, to look at everything that we've installed, all of that COVID stuff, uh, see what we need to keep, see what we need to remove. We don't want to encourage sign blindness with all of those signs. So if we do nothing else at our likely develop sites, it's going to be looking after our COVID signage. So you can see I'm a big advocate for that uh, VSG spectrum. And even in the post-COVID world, I think uh, it's got a place to play. Uh, thanks for listening. I'm sorry you didn't get a song uh, out of me, uh, but that's the way. Hi, Visitor Safety Group. Hope you're all doing well. Welcome to the West Country, welcome to Dartmoor, and welcome to Fernworthy Reservoir. Um, it's a little bit quiet here, it's a little bit cold this morning as well, and um, don't let that deceive you, we've, we've had one hell of a summer. As anyone that saw the recent Simon Reeve documentaries about Cornwall, the South West both benefits and is, is seriously challenged by that huge seasonal influx of visitors. As we eased out of lockdown, the, the first lockdown, people were on furlough, foreign travel was off the cards, Festivals were cancelled, pubs, attractions were closed. We had that great British staycation that we all witnessed and we had that perfect storm. So by May Bank holiday, we knew we were in for a very, very busy summer. Busy in terms of numbers, but also busy managing a different demographic of people. Our visitors increased in places we didn't expect them to, such as here at Fernworthy. As people look for that nice, safe day out, but tried to find places where they thought others wouldn't go and by default ended up in the same place as lots of other people. This had an interesting effect of putting new people in new places, trying new things. It also skewed the risk control spectrum temporarily. We had inexperienced people on undeveloped sites and in high numbers. We thought we'd planned well for the summer, but this caught us a little bit off guard. We knew we shouldn't have a knee-jerk reaction and this was temporary. We do temporary quite well in the southwest. In an ideal world, we'd get that pre-visit information to these people so that they can come prepared. The difficulty for us is we've never seen these people before. I doubt we'll see them again um, on the whole. Um, and I don't think they follow us on Facebook or visit our website. So the big challenge for us is how do we reach these people with that pre-visit information? I've moved to Wimblebore Lake on Exmoor where I'd just like to show you one of our seasonal issues, really. Uh, you can see the bank of the reservoir behind me where every summer we get a few local people gather here and treat it um, a bit like a beach. They like to uh, test the water, have a bit of a paddle, launch their paddle board or inflatable unicorn, but also they come here to, to jump off this. Yeah, I'm not sure what you make of that as a, as, a, as a jump or a pastime, but bear in mind that this is a operational reservoir that supplies Exeter with, with drinking water. And in the summer, the, the level can be significantly lower than it is at the moment. We had up to 500 people here some days and the behaviour just seemed to get worse and worse. In the end, we started working with Southwest Water, the police, Exmoor National Park to try and provide a presence and hand out some safety information on the shoreline. There are all sorts of people turning up with all sorts of equipment. Paddle boards and kayaks are just are getting much cheaper and are now available in supermarkets. 
and people were deciding to take up open water swimming overnight. I think that draw to, to lakes and rivers in the summer is really strong, but these are operational reservoirs with underwater hazards and very, very cold water. We're quite lucky here at Wimbledon because we have an activity centre so we can offer safety cover and we can quickly turn a, a rogue launch into a paying customer. Unfortunately, we also have lots of remote unmanned sites and this year we had the same problems at all of those sites too. And all at once, people just seem to be popping up everywhere. I think the terrifying pictures of very busy beaches was driving people inland to any large water bodies they could see on the map. I think we've just had the busiest year I can remember. It's been really challenging this year with Covid, but it's also given us that great opportunity to welcome that new audience into the countryside. These seasonal issues are always here, but um, it seems like this was a normal year on steroids. This year we needed to review our risk assessments and offer information and warnings in places that would normally be our wellies, waterproofs and a walk brigade, but that was okay. So I guess our role as, as land managers is not to make the site fit the visitor, but help the visitor fit the site or encourage them to find a more suitable site if they don't want to fit. But maybe we just need to ease them in gently with at least some warning of some of those hazards that we all take for granted. Maybe the answer is a temporary seasonal approach to things, but it's certainly not something that's going to ruin the view or people's ability to enjoy these places or feel that element of um, excitement or adventure. Yeah, there's my reflections on 2020 anyway. I'll see you in the breakout session. Cheers. Hi, I'm Andy Stokes. I'm uh, Head of Health, Safety, Environment at uh, RSPB. Uh, and today I'm actually down at RSPB headquarters. Uh, I'm uh, walking in the, uh, the, the Lodge Nature Reserve, which is just completely surrounding the headquarters, a glorious uh, late autumn day. Um, one of the reserves that actually took quite a lot of new people when we first opened up in, in May uh, onto the paths, an overflowing car park as we tried to socially distance them in the car park. And as part of today's VSG seminar, we're really asking that question, should we be doing more about the new visitor? Um, what's, what are the issues that we're facing? People who are coming here, and you know, this is not exactly a well uh, made up path, are they in the right sort of uh, conditions? Do they know what they're coming to? Should we be changing this now because the, uh, the, the visitor is no longer visiting in the segment that we think they ought to be? And I don't think we should be. I actually think we should be staying exactly where we are in terms of our zoning. I think we should be staying exactly where we are because that's the purpose of the nature reserve. So what are we going to do about it? Well, actually, when we opened up, we repurposed some of the staff and volunteers. We had more people out on site welcoming the team, welcoming the visitors, uh, out in the car parks, more notices, change maybe to the websites, letting people know what they were coming to. Because actually, I would rather have a better informed visitor who actually knows what they're coming to than start changing all of our nature reserves to accommodate the ones we've got. We've actually got loads of variety of reserves and I guide the ones who want the urban feel to the urban nature reserves. We don't really want to turn this into an urban nature reserve. And if you think about it, we've all got used to going back into, possibly, Covid secure workplaces. So how much have we invested in that? Are we actually spending lots and lots of money permanently changing our workplaces, throwing loads of desks out? Or are we temporarily changing our workplaces so that when we're allowed to go back to something that passes for normal, We'll actually be able to take down a bit of plastic and we'll be able to take up some of that um, tape and those measures and we'll move the traffic cones outside the front of the toilet doors and bang we've got an office that's still fit for those people who want to come back in the office and i really don't think we're in the position of of changing everything spending loads of money and actually finding that we've, we've done it for, for no reason the hazards here temporarily we need to engage with the public we need to actually uh, communicate with them but I'm really not up for changing much of our nature reserve unless the team actually say, hmm, this is an audience we still want to keep and the ones that we want to keep, we better provide for. That's actually about changing the management plan. It's about changing the purpose of the reserve. It's about changing the zone and turning this from a, a welcome zone into a, 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 sorry, a, a discovery zone into a welcome zone and actually having it available for everybody. That's a reserve choice in a longer term. It's not, shouldn't be a, a knee-jerk response. So for me, this is still fine. 
it still should be left as it is. We shouldn't be covering the surface up, but we should be informing our visitors more about it. And that's on the web, it's, it's with more people at, at the doors. It's just about that communications piece. Unless you're really making a long-term significant change to the purpose of the site, I'd really encourage you not to be doing anything that you can't undo very quickly. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Andy. And indeed, thank you to all the, the, the folk who took time to, to make a video and, and, and share their reflections there. Um, I, some people were commenting there was a bit of challenge with, with, with sound there. So with apologies for that, if you, if you did experience that, we will be sharing the videos. Obviously, as I said earlier, everything will be shared via easing tomorrow and you'll be able to, to, to watch those uh, watch those back again. Um, I suggest turning your, turning your, as I said in Spinal Tap, turn your, turn your speakers up to 11 and uh, hopefully you'll be able to, to hear those okay. Um, so just a final, final a, a shameless plug uh, for the visitor safety in the countryside public Again, a lot of what the speakers have referred to today, in fact, all of what the speakers have referred to today is um, is included in depth. And you could see there that both, you know, Jenny and, and Dave, folk who are doing this day in, day out, still have that as they're as they're manually referred to on a, on a daily basis. So so a, a really key, key document. Um, just a few few things before we pass on to the breakout room, because more more by more by luck than, than good MC, we're only five minutes over over time, which is which is fantastic. Um, but just to remind Mind you, the next date in your diary, again, we'll include this in the easing tomorrow, but the next date in your diary is Tuesday the 19th of, of January. Um, it'll start at 11 o'clock in the morning. We'll be sending out booking information for that in due course. But that next webinar is called the Digital VSG, and that will mark the launch of the new VSG website. So a lot of work been going on behind the scenes on that over the last few months. So we look forward to sharing that with you. That's a, and a lot of members only uh, sections within that site that uh, Again, we'll provide you all the information you need for that in advance, but looking forward to, to sharing that with you. So again, listen, um, thank you very much to all the presenters, to Jenny, to Dave, to Ken, uh, all the other folk who, who took time to, to, to make videos to say, it's not just the time you spend on these attending the webinars, it's all the preparation beforehand. Um, a personal thanks to, to my colleagues, uh, Elizabeth and, and Jane, uh, particularly to Jane, who found all the 50 Ps there in the video meter and, and got, got those working at the end. So thanks, Jane. You literally saved the day there. Um, so listen, uh, we're going to leave you now. Thanks again. And uh, uh, you should find the links to your breakout rooms, either in an easing that was sent out yesterday or I think in the in the message panel as well. Um, so you can click on those. We'll give you a few minutes to get across and your chairs will be ready for those now. Thanks again, folks. All the best.